Homo sapiens is a violent species. We extinguished our competitors with our relatively big brains, our tool making prowess, and our capacity to form bonds and act together, we can cooperate more powerfully for good and for ill than any other species. Our brains are wired to love and trust those who we feel like are like us and to reject and distrust those who are different. When we feel fear or anger, our bodies are flooded with chemicals that make so-called rational thinking very difficult. Moral education, encounters with others, and religion can, can alter our feelings and behavior. A society can develop barriers to and boundaries for aggression, but it is evident our brains in an urbanized, crowded, multi-everything society are fundamentally unchanged in tens of thousands of years. While many societies are not as physically violent as they once were, group-on-group -group violence and violence enacted through law and policy are still everyday human experiences. By now in this course, and probably well before this course, you are aware our nation was born in violence, expanded by violence, became wealthy by violence. Violence against Indian peoples, violence against the lands they inhabited, evidenced by such sins as represented by this mound of bison skulls. Kill the bison and kill the symbiotic relationships between grasslands and the animals that sustain the Plains Indians. Violence was a regular strategy employed against enslaved persons and immigrants working in dangerous, often deadly conditions. Although there is an important debate about the meaning of the Second Amendment in the last few decades, the debate has favored widespread gun ownership. There are an estimated 400 million guns held by private citizens in the United States. And according to a new poll by the Public Religion Research Institute, nearly one in five Americans think violence may be necessary to save the nation. And 40% of people who watch far-right news and think the 2020 election was stolen affirm that patriotism patriotism may require violence. Ceding power to government authorities to regulate violence is one of the marks of society. Exercising the power to regulate violence is almost inevitably accompanied by religious convictions, a sacred canopy that charges governing authorities to decide which expressions of violence are justified and morally acceptable and which are prohibited. You may recall a firestorm that Attorney General Jeff Sessions started in June 2018 regarding the jailing of parents and separating their children from them, surely a form of violence. Quote, I would cite to you the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise co uh, command in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained the government for his purposes. Orderly and lawful processes are good in themselves. Consistent and fair application of the law is in itself a good and moral thing, and that protects the weak and protects the lawful. Right, except when either the wrong person is in office, such as Presidents Obama or Biden, or when you believe a law is unjust and the law is opposed by either civil disobedience or outright insurrection. Righteous violence is done in the name of rectifying a wrong and restoring social order. Examples of righteous violence are the death penalty and declaring a just war. Righteous violence is born in anger, but anger is always self-justifying. It is a perceived wrong that provokes us to anger. Anger should be interrogated carefully before acting on it, and especially before making laws based on it. If you're looking to the Bible to justify violence, you can find legions of authorizations. Despite vengeance is mine, says the Lord, the Bible includes stories of deputized agents of violence, especially when disciplining God's people in the wilderness or in the conquest of Canaan. But there's also the great flood to purify the earth of wicked people and start over. There are the apocalyptic hopes of Daniel, of the Maccabees, and of course, the book of Revelation, the book where Jesus assumes an avenging role, brandishing a two-edged sword in his mouth and leading the great destruction and the great sorting between the damned and the saints. One can find violent events throughout American history.
the Civil War is probably the most Bible-soaked interpretation of violence. Here are three different texts. The quintessential hymn of righteous violence is our, in our hymn books, even today, is the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my condemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his head. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. His truth is marching on. Picking up the sword and dying when necessary by, uh, by the sword in a holy battle fought by agents of God to free people from slavery. Julia Ward Howe borrowed the tune from a song about an abolitionist, John Brown, executed by the Virginia court after his violent failed raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry. John Brown's body is a moldering in the grave, but his soul is marching on, was the lyric, especially popular with black troops. Julia Ward Howe was inspired by Brown's action and the tune to write new verses to recruit more black soldiers for the righteous cause. Let's hear from John Brown as he stood before the judge and jury after his 1859 trial and before he was sentenced to die. He does not admit to violence in the name of God, but only to the intention of his actions to free and slave black people. Violence to which he did not confess was unintentional but necessary to fulfill his liberating intent. He said, in the first place, I deny everything uh, but what I have all along admitted, the design on my part to free slaves. I intended certainly to have made a clean thing of the matter as I did last winter when I went into Missouri and took slaves without the snapping of a gun on either side, moved them through the country and finally left them in Canada. I designed to do the same thing again on a larger scale. That was all I intended. I never did intend to murder or treason or the destruction of property, or to excite or incite slaves to rebellion, or to make insurrection. Uh, his claim is hard to justify, by the way, given that he invaded a federal armory. Um, I have another objection, and that is, it is unjust that I should suffer such penalty. Had I so interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or in behalf of any other friends, and suffered and sacrificed what I have in this interference, um, it would have been all right, and every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. Um, he says it clearly, he deserves a reward for his efforts to liberate the enslaved and not the death penalty. Back to Brown. The court acknowledges, I suppose, the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament. That teaches me that all things whatsoever I would do th uh, that men should do to me should do even so to them. It teaches me further to remember them, that they are uh, them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavor to act up to that instruction. I say I am too young to understand that God in, is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I have always freely admitted I have done, in behalf of his despised poor was not wrong, but right. Now, if it be deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in, his, in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit, so let it be done. So, at the end, he declares his death is for a righteous cause, and unrighteous men are responsible for his death sentence. One of the most famous uses of the Bible to interpret the war is found in President Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. There are two remarkable aspects of Lincoln's words. The first is that one can't imagine any president saying something so self-critical today and not being railroaded from office by his own party. Second, 
listen to the president's humble and profound wrestling with what God's will is and with human beings' puny capacity to know what God is doing, other than that God is a God of freedom and justice. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither part, neither party expected for the war the magnitude of the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and prayed to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we not be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, that of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses, which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war, as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that the mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited labor shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid for another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so must it be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Christians were, of course, on all sides of the conflict that led up to, resulted in, and followed the Civil War, which some in the day called the War for the Abolition of Slavery. Fifty years later, the path-breaking female black journalist Ida B. Wells tried to focus the nation's attention on another form of violence, lynching. Lynching was white-on-black terrorism often carried out by an honor killing by, uh, by white Christian leaders allegedly to protect white Christian womanhood and to preserve the God-given hierarchy of the races. Wells wrote in 1909, Why is mob murder permitted by a Christian nation? What is the cause of this awful slaughter? This question is answered almost daily, always the same shameless falsehood that Negroes are lynched to protect womanhood. All know this is untrue. The cowardly lyncher revels in murder, then seeks to shield himself from public exec ex execration by claiming devotion to woman. The Springfield, Illinois mob rioted for two days the militia of the entire state was called out. Two men were lynched, hundreds of people driven from their homes, all because a white woman said a Negro assaulted her. A mad mob went to the jail, tried to lynch the victim of the charge, and not being able to find him, proceeded to pillage and burn the town and lynch two innocent men. Later, after the police had found the woman's charge was false, she published a retraction. The indictment was dismissed and the intended victim discharged. But the lynched victims were dead. Hundreds were homeless, and Illinois was disgraced. The only certain remedy for lynching is an appeal to law. Lawbreakers must be made to know that human life is sacred and that every citizen of the country is first a citizen of the United States and secondly a citizen of the state in which he belongs. By the way, folks, one hears an echo from the future right, the Voting and Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 65. 
This nation must assert itself and protect its federal citizenship at home as well as abroad. The strong arm of the government must reach across state lines whenever unbridled lawlessness defies state laws and must give to the individual under the stars and stripes the same measure of protection it gives to him while he travels in foreign lands. Time was when lynching appeared to be sectional, but now it is national, a blight upon our nation, mocking our laws and disgracing our Christianity. With malice toward none and with charity for all, let us undertake the work of making the law of the land effective and supreme upon every foot of American soil. A shield to the innocent and to the guilty, punishment swift and sure. Well, Ida B. Wells wrote about extrajudicial executions. A well-known Christian opponent of judicial executions is Sister Helen Prejean. Here's an excerpt from an interview she gave with NPR's Terry Gross. Jesus' biggest challenge to us is to love our enemies. On death row, I encountered the enemy, those considered so irredeemable by our society that even our Supreme Court has made it legal to kill them. For 20 years now, I've been visiting people on death row, and I've accompanied six human beings to their deaths. As each has been killed, I have told them to look at me. I want them to see a loving face when they die. I want my face to carry the love that tells them that they and every one of us are worth more than our most terrible acts. In other words, she's arguing that the image of God is not completely erased by the person's worst actions. It's really important we get religion right, because God, you know, religion is used in so many ways to hurt people especially Christianity. Do you feel like you're seeing that right now? I'll give one example. Jeff Sessions, before him, Justice Scalia, quoting Romans 13, that if anything is the law in the United States, we obey civil authority because it has the authority of God. And Justice Scalia quoted that to justify the death penalty. And Jeff Sessions just quoted that uh, because it's the law for people to enter the the country illegally so you can separate children from their parents. And he brought in divine authority to sanction it. And that is really, really harmful. It is so opposite to the compassion and mercy and love that Jesus taught us that it just, I can't tell you what it does to see that happening over and over again by these people who claimed Christianity and then quote even the words of Jesus sometimes to hurt people, to disrespect them, and to claim that this suffering we're causing of separating children from their parents is really God's will because it's legal. And I'll quote Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk, but I still make retreat with the Trappist monks at Gethsemane, who said, when the world ends, it'll be legal. Sister Helen, thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. There are Christians who constitutionally oppose to all forms of violence, including self-defense. Pacifists have been found throughout American history from the peace churches such as Mennonites and Quakers, but there are other traditions of Christian pacifism. It was hard to be a pacifist during World War I. During World War II, with Hitler bearing down on nation after nation in Europe, and then after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, it was nearly impossible for a Christian to be a pacifist. We'll hear from two pacifists with a non-pacifist in between them. First is Dorothy Day, leader in the Catholic worker movement from the mid 20th century, writing in the Catholic work, worker publication in 1942. Her Catholic pacifist stance and that of her allies cost the magazine most of its readership. Dear fellow workers in Christ, we will print the words of Christ who is with us always, even to the end of the world. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute and calumniate you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, who makes his sun rise on the good and the evil and sends rain on the just and unjust. We are at war, a declared war, with Japan, Germany, and Italy. But still we can repeat Christ's words each day holding them close to our hearts, each month printing them in the paper. 
In times past, Europe has been a battlefield. But let us remember St. Francis, who spoke of peace, and we will remind our readers of him too, so they will not forget. We are still pacifists. Our manifesto is the Sermon on the Mount, which means that we will try to be peacemakers. Speaking for many of our conscientious objectors, we will not participate in armed warfare or in making munitions or by buying government bonds to prosecute the war or in urging others to these efforts. But neither will we be carping in our criticism. We love our country and we love our president. We have been the only country in the world where men of all nations have taken refuge from oppression. We recognize that in the order of intention, we have tried to stand for peace, for love for our brother, in the order of execution, we have failed as Americans to live up to our principles. Our work of mercy may take us into the midst of war. As editor of The Catholic Worker, I would urge our friends and associates to care for the sick and the wounded, to the growing of food for the hungry, to the continuance of all our works of mercy in all our houses and in all our farms. Because of our refusal to assist in the prosecution of war and our insistence that our collaboration be one for peace, we may find ourselves in difficulties. But we trust in the generosity and understanding of our government and our friends to permit us to continue our paper to preach Christ crucified. Professor, public theologian, and intellectual Reinhold Niebuhr took a different position from Day. He advocated for Christian realism. He wrote an essay in 1940, Why the Christian Church is Not Pacifist. It is the only essay I've cited, I think, that is not available online. Niebuhr's argument is rooted in an understanding of sin and what it takes to confront sin and evil. Here is the essence of Niebuhr's position in his own words. The failure of the church to espouse pacifism is not apostasy, but is derived from an understanding of the Christian gospel, which refuses simply to equate the gospel with the law of love. Christianity is not simply a new law, namely the law of love. The finality of Christianity cannot be proved by the analyses which seek to reveal that the law of love is stated more unambiguously and perfectly in the life and teachings of Christ than anywhere else. Christianity is a religion which measures the total dimensions of human ex existence, not only in terms of the final norm of human contact, conduct, which is expressed in the law of love, but also in terms of the fact of sin. It recognizes that the same man who can become his true self only by striving infinitely for self-realization beyond himself is also incredibly involved in the sin of infinitely making his partial and narrow self the true end of existence. There is a form of Christian pacifism which is not heresy, a pacifism which seeks perfect love of God and neighbor in individual relations and eschews politics completely. Yet most modern forms of Christian pacifism are heretical. Presumably inspired by the Christian gospel, they have really absorbed the Renaissance faith and the goodness of man, have rejected the Christian doctrine of original sin as an outmoded bit of pessimism, have reinterpreted the cross so that it is made to stand for the absurd idea that perfect love is guaranteed a simple victory over the world, and have rejected all other profound elements of the Christian gospel as Pauline accretions, which must be stripped from the simple gospel of Jesus. In other words, one cannot talk about the gospel without including love, power, justice, sin, and grace. For Niebuhr, talking about love alone uh, is naive, he says, and even dangerous. Um, this form of pacifism is not only heretical when judged by the standards of the total gospel, it is equally heretical when judged by the facts of human existence. There are no historical realities which remotely conform to it. It is important to recognize this lack of conformity to the facts of experience as a criterion of heresy. Niebuhr goes on to say how a Christian always lives by grace because sin and participation in sin is inevitable in the world of politics and nations. The world of politics and nations is a world that must include responses to violence that themselves will be forms of violence. Otherwise, one allows tyranny and injustice free reign. 
Well, one of Niebuhr's most potent and widely known contemporary critics is Stanley Hauerwas. He wrote an essay 10 days after 9-11. He writes with care to working out how being joined to Christ and Christ's community requires one to practice nonviolence. He wrote, I am a pacifist because I think nonviolence is the necessary condition for a politics not based on death. I should like to think pacifism names the habits and community necessary to gain the time and place that is an alternative to revenge, but I do not pretend to know how that is accomplished. I never really wanted to be a pacifist. I had learned from Reinhold Niebuhr that if you desire justice, you had better get ready to kill someone along the way. But then John Howard Yoder in his extraordinary book, The Politics of Jesus, came along. In short, Christians are not nonviolent because we believe our nonviolence is a strategy to get rid the world of war, but rather because faithful followers of Christ in a world of war cannot imagine being anything else than nonviolent. Where does that leave me? Does it mean, as an estranged friend recently wrote me, that I disdain all natural loyalties? that bind us together as human beings, even submitting such loyalties to a harsh, and, a harsh and unforgiving standard? Do I forsake all forms of patriotism, failing to acknowledge that we as a people are better off because of the sacrifices that were made in World War II? To this I can only answer, yes. If you call patriotism natural, I certainly do disavow that connection. Such a disavowal, I hope, does not mean I am inattentive to the gifts I received from the past and present neighbors. In response to my friend, I pointed out that because he too is a Christian, I assumed he also disdained some natural loyalties. After all, he had his children baptized. The natural love between parents and children is surely reconfigured when children are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. Christians often tend to focus on being united with Christ in his resurrection, forgetting that we are also united with him in his death. What could that mean if it does not mean that Christians must be ready to die, indeed have their children die, rather than betray the gospel? Any love not transformed by the love of God cannot help but be the source of the violence we perpetuate on one another in the name of justice. Such a love may appear harsh and dreadful from the perspective of the world, but Christians believe such a love is life-giving, not life-denying. Pacifists are often challenged after an event like September 11th with the question, well, what alternative do we have to bombing Afghanistan? Such a question assumes that pacifists must have an alternative foreign policy. My only response is, I do not have a foreign policy. I have something better, a church constituted by people who would rather die than kill. Indeed, I fear that absent a counter community to challenge America, bin Laden has given Americans what they so desperately needed, a war without end. America is a country that lives off the moral capital of our wars. And this is me speaking now. I've included these next three paragraphs because how true they turned out to be in the last 20 years. We all know the first casualty of war is truth. So the conservatives who have fought the war against postmodernism in the name of objective truth, the same conservatives that now rule us, assume they can use language any way they please. Moreover, when our country is at war, it has no space to worry about the extraordinary inequalities that constitute our society, no time to wor worry about poverty or those parts of the world that are ravaged by hunger and genocide. Everything, civil liberties, due process, the protection of law, must be subordinated to the one great moral enterprise of winning the unending war against terrorism. At the heart of the American desire to wage endless war is the American fear of death. On September 11th, Americans were confronted with their worst fear, a people ready to die as an expression of their profound moral commitments. Some speculate such people must have chosen death because they were desperate, or at least that they were so desperate that death was preferable to life. Yet their willingness to die stands in stark contrast to a politics that asks of its members in response to September 11th to shop. You may remember President Bush advocated for consumer patriotism shopping in the last days, in the days following the attacks. 
Among American, among, among Western wealthy nations, America is a particularly religious and particularly violent state. We tell ourselves stories to justify our violence toward others, especially related to our safety and our right to conduct our business. It can't be incidental to America's story that God, guns, and guts made America free is a popular saying and a formula for a kind of moral order. Once again, Christians can be found on many sides of our debates about the righteous use of violence.